so we, we started off this series talking about 2 Chronicles 7, where God was tell, talking to the children of Israel, and, and Israel had this habit that when times were good, they would do a couple things. One, they would forget, stop worshiping God. They would get out of the, the weekly practice of worshiping God, and then they would create idols. What God blessed them with, they would then elevate. And, and so God knew that this was coming in their future, so he gave them a promise of, of the power of prayer to say, hey, when you get lost, when you lose your way, this is your way home. And so we talked about the first week of this series, what do we do with these events in life? How do we pray through those moments? And I actually gave you six types of events that, that, that kind of bring turmoil in our life and, and what we do with those to help us in the place of prayer. But it all started with this foundational scripture in Second Chronicles seven fourteen. It says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And he says, I'll heal their land. He says, the place of prayer does a couple things. We, we come with the humbleness of heart. We're going to pray and seek his face. We're going to turn from our ways that are not godly, the ways that we know, hey, this does not make God happy. And he says, when we do that through the place of prayer, he says, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to forgive. And then he says something that is so critical and it's so beautiful. He says, even though you may have hurt yourself by your decisions, he says, I will restore you. And what God has given us through the place of prayer is an avenue to get his attention in our life and to bring God's power into our life. Whether it's forgiveness that you're seeking, whether it's freedom that you're seeking, whether it's the restoration of your soul, it, prayer is the way that we invite God into the circumstances of our life. But, but I think so often, and for us as believers, and I'll, I'll say this for myself, I underestimate the power of prayer. I often want to talk about my problems. I want to do something. I'll, I'll try to fix my problems. But God says, listen, um, it, this is something that's done through the power of prayer, through the place of prayer. And, it, and it's really honestly easy to become prayerless in our life. I think it's easy to become prayerless and it's almost natural not to pray because we've often lived our lives as if we are our own God. And what I mean by that is that we think that the fixing of things and the restoration of things rest upon our shoulders. And so, so often when we go through life, we, we, we basically talk to ourselves and try to figure out how we can fix it. And that's how prayerlessness works in our life. Because it's not a natural thing to do. It's part of your new nature in Christ is to go to God with the things that you're burdened about. And I'd even say it this way. I would say that prayer is kind of a thermometer of your soul. It kind of lets you know spiritually where you're at with circumstances in your life. If you're prayerless in an area in your life, most likely it's because you think God is powerless in that area in your life. That if you really thought God could do something about it, you would be talking to him about it all the time. And what do you do? I mean, when you, when you pray, you're, you're basically saying, God, I know that you are the solution to this. And I think in our lives right now, in this room, there is untapped power and resources available to us because we simply don't pray and we simply don't obey what he asks us to do when we do pray. And so we're doing this series, and we'll continue it next month uh, on prayer to really help sh shape us and focus us, because this is what I think. I think there's circumstances in your life that are about to change, but God is waiting on you to pray about them. If y'all remember at the beginning of the year, the Holy Spirit laid on my heart this, this scripture that says God's going to allow us to do the impossible this year. But I think it's through the power of prayer. A couple of weeks ago, Hudson, our, our youngest child, our son, had to have surgery on his leg. And so uh, Julie and I got him to the, the, the surgery center at about 6 a.m. And we first met with the nurse, and then we met with the doctor. And they kind of told us what they were going to do. And then we said, well, what's our role? How can we help? And they're like, well, when it goes to recovery, that's when mom and dad, you step in, and you step into that role of recovery. And so we just, you know, we, we, we talked with Hudson before, he let, before they rolled him away, and we prayed with him, and, and we just had this peace that, man, the doctor's going to do the very best that he can do, and those nurses and the anesthesiologist is going to do the very best that, that he can do, and then we're going to get him back, and, and we're just going to help him recover because that's all we can do. Did you know when that surgery was taking place, not once did, did I run back into that surgery room and say, hey, let me take control of this. Like, I don't know if y'all are doing this right. I, I need to do this. 
Not once did I run over to the anesthesiologist or the nurse and rip the resources out of their hands and roll my son back down the hall. Number one, I'd probably go to jail for that. But number two, I know that I couldn't do what they were doing. I knew that they had the skill set and the expertise and the equipment to do something I'm, un I'm not equipped to do. And I started to think about that. I thought, why is it that, that we'll trust a doctor to do something? And we'll say, even though he's flawed, even though he's human, I really trust in his ability. And so we surrender that. Or, or even when you go out to eat, you're trusting in that cook to cook your food properly and in a healthy way. Or, or you trust that the home you live in. Some of y'all have two-story homes. And, and when you're asleep on that first floor, you're just trusting that that architect who designed that house and the guys who built that house did a good job so that you're not Mr. Pancake in the morning, right? And so many times in our life, we're willing to put our lives in the hand of men and of friends because we trust them. But so many times in our life, in the place of prayer, God wants to work on something. He says, I just want you to pray, and I want you to surrender it to me. But we go running into the, emergency, the surgery room of heaven, and we rip, God's, rip it out of God's hands and say, no, no, no. I'm going to do this one on my own. And I think what prayer is intended to do is prayer is intended to give us rest. And most, a lot of times we are anxious in our life and we're dry in our life and we're worried in our life because we haven't surrendered things to God. We're still carrying stuff that God said is mine. And for some of y'all in the room, the, the reason you're so strung out and stressed out and dried out is because you're not giving things to God in prayer. You're holding on to them. And what I want to show you through this series is there's things that God says, I want you to trust me like you do your doctor. I want you to trust me like you do the, 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 the house you live in. I want you to put trust in me and, turn, and don't turn back to it. Let me do what I want to do. So today I want to look at a prayer that became really popular a few years ago. Uh, it's called the prayer of Jabez. And it's also in Chronicles. And, um, you know, for me, I, I tried to read the Bible through every year because I'm just a good Christian like that. And um, I'm just kidding. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a decent Christian, right? Not great, but I'm working at it, okay? Um, so I, I like to read it through, and there's, there's a couple books that I just struggle reading through. And First Chronicles is one of them because the whole book is basically he begat, begat, and she begat, and they begat, and they begat, and, and this is black begat, and back. And they just, they just begat each other, this whole book. And so halfway through that begatting that there's there, uh, about 600 names, they pause when it comes to Jabez, and they mention this prayer that this man prayed. And it's the only reference really of him in scripture is this prayer. And so if, 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 the, if God led the writers of scripture to pause and to, and to record this prayer, this prayer must really matter to God. And so if it matters to him, it really should matter to us. So I want to look at this real quick. Uh, First Chronicles 4, 9. Jabez was more honorable than his brother's his mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. He says, oh, that you would bless me, that you would enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Let me pray real quick one more time before we jump into this. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that, Father, within it, you give us a template, you give us a way, you give us the principles, Father, to change and transform our life. And I pray for all of us in this room that we humble ourselves before the power and the authority of your word and through the leadership of your Holy Spirit. And we say, God, use this word to change our life today and change our circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the first thing we see about Jabez, the scripture says, is that his, he was more honorable than his brothers. That's not how the life of Jabez began. Scripture says his life began in pain and sorrow. But somewhere between being born and labeled pain and sorrow, his life became more honorable. And I think the prayer that he prayed captures what, what happened in his life that allowed him to transform from pain and sorrow and another word for more honorable would be more glorious. In other words, he, was, he, he, he did exceedingly above what his brothers did. So if his, you have to keep in mind, for Jabez, what his name literally meant, every time he told people him, his name, hi, I am Jabez, he was telling people, I am pain and I am sorrow. 
If you can imagine being labeled with something in your heart that, that travels before you, that's always with you. So wherever Jabez went, pain and sorrow was, was present with him, a reminder of how he came into this world. And I think for, for many of us in this room that we understand that there are things that happen to us in life that feel like labels. We may not be named that. We may not be named heartbroken. We may not be named failure. We may not be named uh, this or that. But regardless, we carry that with us, and it's always in our heart and our mind. And sometimes how we get those labels in our life are not necessarily words spoken over us, though they may be words, but it may be something that a parent did. It may be something that a spouse did. It may be something a friend did. It may be something that a boss did. But, but somehow, somewhere in your life, you, you stop being just you and you became this label that you carry around. For some, it's a label, well, I'm a failure or I'm expendable. You, you carry around this label, well, I'm rejected, or I'm broken, or I'm dumb, or, or oh, well, listen, I'm just a mistake, or I'm overlooked, I'm, I'm underappreciated, I'm misunderstood all the time, I'm worthless. For some, it, their, their, their physical value, they feel ugly, they feel like they're, they're unwanted. For some, they carry around the label, well, I'm an afterthought, I'm a second choice, I, I'm too poor, I'm, I'm bad with money, I'm divorced, I'm barren. I mean, the labels go on and on and on, and they're as diverse as the circumstances that can surround a life. In fact, I would say it to you this way, it's hard to go through life without picking up labels. Because unfortunately, this world that we live in is great at creating pain. And this world that we live in is great at labeling people. Past few weeks, I've met with people, different people in different circumstances, and my heart is broken because I look at the world we live in, and I say, this world can be such an evil place. And the ways of this world are so destructive that they, they tear us down and destroy what God loves. And so many times in our life, when these labels finally settle into our heart, and they become defining for us, and they create borders for us, and they, they knock our legs out, and, and we choose to be bitter, and we choose to be broken, and, and, and we begin to shrink back from our dreams, and we doubt our purpose, and we drown in our emotions simply because of a label that was given to us through circumstances that were out of our control. Jabez was labeled by his mother, you are sorrow and you are pain, but Jabez overcame his label. And his prayer is a key to how he overcame that label. See, Jabez could have stopped there in his life and he could have surrendered to that label. He says, I am sorrow and I am pain. Nothing good is going to come out of me. And some of you in this room, you could surrender to your label that your circumstances have put on you. And you can allow that label to become the North Star that guides your life and limits your futures and limits your dreams and, and kills your purpose. In fact, I would say this, that, that, that you could allow that label to become your name if you let it. But a label does something, also, does something totally different. It, it also can make your future so amazing because you're walking out of something that should have held you back. You can also walk away from that label and those circumstances that limited you and become something that God has called you to be. Last week, uh, Andrew did a great job sharing a message for our back-to-school students, and he mentioned the story of how John the Baptist got his name, that his dad was in the temple worshiping. The Lord told him, I don't want you to name him a family name that represents your past and your history. I want you to name him this name John because he's he's gonna go before the Messiah. And so John's name, his label, was not who his family was, his past, his history, but his name, his label that God gave him represented the future and the vision that God had for him. And somehow Jabez, a few thousand years ago, figured out how to change the label on his life through a very simple prayer. And this is what he prayed. There's four parts in that verse 10. He says, oh, that you would bless me. He says, oh, that you'd bless me. Then he prayed, God, enlarge my territory." Then he prayed, God, let your hand be upon me. And the fourth thing he prayed, keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And so I want to talk about these four things in our life. And I want to talk about how these four things can rewrite the labels that we live in every day of our life. The very first thing we see is that, oh, that you would bless me. The very first thing that Jabez prayed for is that God would bless him. Pray for blessing. Now, he, what he was asking for is God to put something on him that he couldn't do for himself. Uh, Julie shared a message on Friday night uh, about the favor of God. What he asked for was, God, I want your favor. God, I want your blessing. God, I want your wisdom in my life. See, God's blessing is his presence in your life. 
He, you can't change, you know, uh, he can't change your past. And that's just true. You cannot go back in time and change what happened to you and how you got that label and how you ended up where you are today. But what Jabez prayed is, says, listen, I can't go rewrite my history, but I can definitely change my destiny. I definitely can change my future. And I know to do that is through your blessing on my life. And I thank you, the Father, and I ask you right now to bless my future, to change my future with your blessing. That, God, your blessing is going to make me bigger than me. That you're going to use my life. And the way you're going to use my life is it's going to outperform the, my own ability. Think of it this way. What Jabez was saying is basically if God was sitting physically on a chair today on this stage. And he says, I want you to come and ask me for something. What would you ask God for? And how hard of it. And it would be so easy for you to believe if, if he, he said, God, I want your blessing in my life. And he said, yes, you are blessed. Then there would be such confidence in that. But I'm telling you right now in prayer, there is no distance. And the reality is just the same. That if we ask God for this, he, he can do it. See, God wants to bless every person in this room so that you can be a blessing. God not only wants to give to you, but God wants to give through you. That God wants to utilize your life, not only to, he wants to love and care for you, but he wants to use your life to bless other people around you. And I'm not talking about have, asking for God's blessing so that you just have enough for you. If you're just asking for enough for you, you're not asking for God's blessing, you're just asking for provision. But God's blessing in your life is when you have the excess in your life to do something beyond your own ability to benefit the people that are all around your life. It's your church family, it's your work family, it's the people in your home. And God's blessing is richer than just finances. It has to do with your resources, has to do with your dreams, has to do with your connections, has to do with the gifts God's given you in your life. God can increase all those things. And if you want to be blessed, if you want to pray the prayer of Jabez and say, hey, God, I want God's blessing, then you have to dedicate your life to being a blessing. You're not asking for a blessing for yourself. That's provision. You're saying, God, use my life to do something more. Listen to what Acts 20, 35 says. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. What Jesus is saying here is so much bigger than money. We boil it down to money, but it's so much bigger. For some of us in this room, to walk in God's blessing is that, that as you pray, that all of a sudden all that anxiety you li live in begins to go away, and all that worry and all that believing the worst about people, what if, what if that begins to slowly just drain out of your life, and in that place, something else filled up? Imagine what kind of person you would be if anxiety wasn't ruling and reigning in your heart. For you, the blessing that would overtake your life is just the peace of God. See, God's blessing in your life is so that God blesses you so you can be a blessing to the world around you. So here's a good question when you say, well, what should I ask God to bless me with? I would put it to you this way. What can God bless me with so that I can be a blessing to others? If you're going to seek God's blessing in your life, then you should say, Father, I pray that you'd bless me with this because I know it would bless the people in my life. That's how we navigate what is God's blessing for us. Genesis 12, 2 says this, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others. That was God's intent. So Jabez prayed, God, first bless my life so I can be a blessing to others. Psalms 1835, you give me your shield of victory and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. What God's blessing does in our life is says, listen, I know you were born in pain and sorrow, but I'm going to stoop down. I'm going to lift you up to make you more honorable than all your brothers. So the first thing he prayed for was God's blessing. The second thing he prayed for was influence. He said, enlarge my territory. He said, God, I want you to stretch me. I want you to take me places that are bigger than me, that are beyond my ability. And that's just the truth for everybody in this room. God has a bigger life for you. See, the happiest people I know in the world are not the people that have a lack of problems. It's people that understand the point of their purpose. If you're going to pray for God to enlarge you, you're not praying a selfish prayer because life is not about you. There's more. And what you're praying for is that, listen, God, I pray for a clear purpose in my life that I can live my life through this lens of I want to be who God created me to be. So, God, I, I think my world is this big, but you made my world this big. So, God, increase my influence, increase the reach of my life, increase the, increase the, the reach of who I am. For me, as a pastor, it's something that I, I pray for every time. And I have a, a literal physical pulpit to preach from. 
but you don't. I mean, that'd be kind of weird at the house, right? But, or to work, be like, hold on, I have something to say. You know, like, that, okay, that was somewhat funny. Okay, I could have grinned. Um, but, but what you do is, even though you don't have a pulpit like I have, you have influence everywhere you go. You have influence at work. You have influence at home. You have influence wherever you are. And what, he, what Jabez prayed, he said, God, expand my influence. Listen to what Ephesians 1.18 says. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. He says there is hope attached to the, the things that he has called you to do. And when we understand that he, that he gives us hope that we can make a difference, that he gives us hope so that we can be an influence in the world, that we understand that Christ Jesus has accumulated an inheritance. And what is an inheritance? It's something that you walk in that you didn't earn or, you don't, or didn't deserve. You get it because of the relationship that you have with the one that created it. And God has created things that you aren't going to earn. That's what his favor is. You're just going to walk into something that God says, I've created for you. See, when your heart is awakened to the value that God has for you, and all of a sudden you wake up, it changes who you are. It changes how you live your life. That I think all of us in this room have influence, but most of us forget it. That, but that's what set Jabez apart, is while everybody else was sleeping through this truth, Jabez was awaking, uh, waking up to it. That's why he became more honorable than his brothers. And I would say the world that we live in is great at putting us to sleep. It's like, you know, when it finally gets a little cool outside, and you go eat that giant lunch, and you know you should stop eating those chips, but you ask for another basket. You're like, bring it on. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. Basket four, more queso, please. Like, just bring it, right? And then you eat that, and you instantly, after you eat the meal, have food regret. You're, you're big. And you're just like, uh. and then you're like, I'm going to go home. And you turn on that ceiling fan, and you turn on a game, maybe even golf, and you, get, and you just kind of lay down. And then you yell at your family to stay out of the room so you can sleep sometimes. And you just, you lay down and you just, you're just gone. That's the world that we live in. It likes to fill us up with stuff and just lull us to sleep. So that our purpose slowly, just year by year, year by year, we put it off. But Jabez says, God, awaken that. You can find the hope of your calling. See, we believe here at City Point that you, God designed you for something. It's why we take time at our Connection Point class to do a, we do a, a personality uh, survey to figure out your personality and a gifting survey just to hopefully wake you up to, hey, these are the things God's given you to make an influence in this life. Psalms 2.8 says this, ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. Jabez asked, you should ask, God, give me influence. Let me change the lives and be a part of changing lives of the people around me. Here's three questions I often ask myself about the influence that I have for God to use in my life. And I think it may help you. It's not in your notes, so it may be worth writing down. Number one, you ask yourself, where am I going? What's, what's the point of my life? Why, why am I on this road? Where am I at in my journey? Why, where am I going? The second thing I ask is, why does this matter? Why, why does it matter what I'm doing or how I'm doing it? And when we begin to ask those questions, it helps shape our influence into, into task, and it helps shape our influences into what we're available to us. And then the third thing I ask myself is, who can I take with me? Who around me can I influence with the influence God has given me? See, influence is meant to be spent on people, not selfishly exhausted on yourself. The third thing he prayed for, he says, let your hand be with me. He says, God, if you're going to bless my life, if you're going to use me to, to you know, work through me for others, if you're going to use me to influence others, God, if my life is just going to be bigger than my little life and bigger than just me going to work and paying bills, if my life is actually going to leave a mark here on this planet and give glory to you, he says, then God, I want one more thing. He says, God, I, I want your presence to go with me. I want your hand on my life. Paul prayed this prayer in Ephesians 1.19. He says, I pray, and this is right after he said that I just read the previous verse. He says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. That the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in heavenly places of honor, God's right hand in heavenly realms. Paul prays that I pray that you would understand that God's power is available for you, when you in, in your life. 
And he says, this is the type of God's power that's available to you. That same power that allowed Jesus to do his earthly ministry, that allowed him to, to not shrink under persecution, that allowed him to stand up strong and, and face his critics, that allowed him to love people and change lives and make disciples. That same love that allowed him to march to that cross and suffer on that cross, but the same power that also stared death in the eye and overcame it three days later. He says, that same power now is available to you. And if you're running your race and you're running out of juice and you're running dry and you're running out of energy, you've got to stop and say, God, I need your power in my life right now. You don't stop what you're doing. You stop and refill. So many times spiritually, when we physically get hungry, we stop and what? We eat. But spiritually, so often I find that people don't stop and spiritually eat. They just quit. And it's because they're not running on God's power. Believe me, if the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is living on you, there is nothing in your life that you, can, you cannot do. In fact, I would put it to you the way Scripture says, you can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens you. And some of y'all in this room today are running so low, it's because you haven't stopped and say, you know what, God, I know that there is power available to me, and I pray that it be poured out in my life. I'm not leaving my room. I'm not leaving my car. I'm not leaving this, this environment, God, until I receive from you what I need because you promised it for me. And I would even say in your relationships, ask for God's wisdom and his hand on your relationship. I remember I was talking to a couple a few years ago, and they're having conflict resolution issues in their marriage, and they said, what should we do? I said, well, y'all should arm wrestle, is what I said. Um, no, nah, I'm just kidding, because she clearly would have won. Um, but I said, what you need to do is when y'all get into that moment, I said, you just step away and just pray. And say, God, how do, I, how do you want me to deal with this? You know, how do you, this is your daughter. I don't know what's wrong with her. You know, like, or say, yeah, I'm just kidding. Or, or this is your man. I mean, obviously you took more than a rib when you made him. So, you know, how do I, how do I deal with this? And invite God's presence into it. And, and Jabez was smart enough to say, you know what? I need God's presence. It's the same prayer that Moses prayed in Exodus 33. He says this, the Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, he says, don't even send us up there. How will anybody know that you're, you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else? It's a great question. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked. See, God's power in your life is what distinguishes you from everybody else on this planet. It's the reason God says you can do all things. It's the reason God believes in us and gives us a purpose bigger than ourselves. It's the reason God calls us the generosity of lifestyle because he says I, you're going to be different than everybody else. And what God told him here, he says, I will do the very thing you have asked. So my question this morning, if Jabez asked for God's hand and his power, have you asked for God's hand and his power in your life? And when we stop and pause and say, God, I need you. God, I'm overcome by this. This is overwhelming for me to think about. I don't have the emotional horsepower to do this. I don't have the financial horsepower. God, I need your help. Every Sunday before I come onto this stage, I stop behind that curtain and I lift my hands to God. And I say, God, fill me with your presence and use me in a way that glorifies you. God, somebody sitting out there is waiting to hear your voice, and I pray that you'd use me to be that voice. And God, if I ever do anything that offends you, convict me of it so I don't live a way that you can't put your hand on. God's hand in our life, God's power in our life, is what allows us to live the life that Scripture defines. The reason Jabez become more honorable than his brothers is because Jabez says, God, bless me. So I can be a blessing. God, increase my influence. But God, I refuse to do it without your power. The fourth thing that Jabez asked for, he says, keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Obviously, there was a concern for Jabez's future that he would relive his history because he came from pain and sorrow. And he says, you know what, God, protect me. So that my life doesn't end the same way that it began. God, I don't want to run back to my label. I want to run away from my label into who you've called me to be. So from Jabez right now, we've got this simple prayer life. You can do this every day. In fact, it's part of how I pray. I say, God, I pray for your blessing in my life today, God. I pray for you just, Father, to give, give me the resources to do what you've called me to do. 
God, I thank you for your influence in my life today. I thank you for your influence in all that I do. God, expand my territory. Expand the, my influence in my life, God. Beyond what I think I can do, expand it to the place where you have called me to do. God, I pray for your presence in my life right now. Father, I don't want to leave this moment without knowing that you're not only in me, but your power is upon me. And then, God, I ask that you would protect me, that you would guard me from the enemy in my life. So because you're doing the will of God, you're going to make the devil mad. That's just a fact of life. Anytime this church wants to move forward, I, I, I feel God saying, hey, this is what we got for us. Then I also know there's an attack. And I'm not afraid of the attack. I was born to fight. Because scripture says I'm, I'm coming at the devil from a place of victory. I'm not trying to be victorious. I am. And what we have to understand is, is, is that when we, we have that protection that God gets us, that, that we have to understand that sometimes when you're doing the will of God, you're going to make some people mad. You're definitely going to make the devil mad. And that's why we live with this mindset that, that our life is a target for the enemy. And so that's why we have to look at our relationships and our finances and our body and our marriages through a different lens because we understand the devil is looking for a crack to get into our house. And as I was preparing this message, the Lord spoke really clear me, clearly to me that this is for somebody in this room, that you need to stop fighting flesh and blood. You need to kick the devil out of your house. You need to kick strife and offense out of your home. Stop blaming it on the person you're married to or the kids in the house and just blame it on the devil himself and say, this spirit, this, this has no influence in our home. Because scripture says this, 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's knocking on doors, seeing who will open up the door. And if we open up that door, the enemy says, I was born to attack you. And I tell the devil, I was born to defeat you. And that's what you determine in your life. If, if there's a battle going on, I was made to win it because God has you and God has me. That he, you, you're equipped for the battle that you're facing today. That battle is not going to overwhelm you. Those forces are not too great. Greater is he that's on the inside of you than he that is in this world. And the biggest thing the enemy combats us with, if God is a God of truth and the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth, the devil is a liar. And the chief way that he destroys our life is not through circumstances, not through finances, not through health, but trying to get you to believe a lie. Because if he can believe a lie, he can reinstate the label that you're trying to walk away from. And what Jabez was fighting was, listen, I'm fighting the label of pain and sorrow. God, protect me from that label that it does. I don't end my life the same way it began. And what the enemy wants to do is say, listen, I know you're trying to get away from that label. Yeah, you're a failure. That's what you are. No, you don't have good relationships. No, you're never going to be financially free. No, you, don't, you can't serve. You're not worthy. But when you push back, you say, no, that's a lie. You push back the enemy at his same strategic point. I can tell you this, ignoring the devil is not overcoming him. Ignoring the battle is not the way to win the battle. 1 John 4, 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. And you've already won the victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in this world. We live from a position of victory, not a position of trying to be victorious. The enemy attacks you to reinforce the label that he wants you to live out of. Protect me, what Jabez said. Protect me, God, so that I'm not limited by my label. Walk me into who you've called me to be. Nothing can separate you from the will of God. You can do everything that God has called you to do. The devil cannot stop what God has ordained in your life. God is on your side. And from this very simple lesson, from this very simple prayer, we learn that Jabez surrendered to God's blessing in his life. We learn that he surrendered to God's influence in his life. We learn that he surrendered to God's presence in his life. We learn that he surrendered to God's protection in his life. And it all started because Jabez prayed over his life rather than running down, rather continuing with the label that he was given. Prayer does one thing, or many things, but today the one thing I want you to focus on is prayer is an act of surrender. You surrender to his blessing. You surrender to his influence. You surrender to God's presence. You surrender to God's protection. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for everybody today. God, I pray that you would bless them in such a way that the enemy cannot reject it. I pray that, Father, you would bless them so that they could be a blessing. That, Father, they're not, you're not giving to them, you're giving through them. God, I pray that they would be an influence, that you would enlarge the circle of, of who they are and what God can use them for. The enemy tries to shrink their influence, God. I pray that you would expand it. 
Give them dreams and lead them by your spirit. God, I pray for your presence to rest upon the people of this congregation. That, Father, we would not walk anywhere in life without your hand going with us. Otherwise, how are we different from the world that we live in? And, God, I pray for your protection. I thank you that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The weapons formed against our kids and our marriages and our finances and our bodies, we call them to destruction. And we say we're going to overcome the enemy. What he's meant for evil, God's going to turn around for our good. Father, if you blessed a man named Jabez because he prayed this, God, then I ask that you bless us. That you help us rewrite the labels that we lived out of. Change the circumstances that we feel trapped in. In Jesus' name.